Okay, so quick disclaimer for the people in the room. Um, predicting what the government is going to do with control frameworks is probably harder than predicting the weather. Like, we don't have models. We don't have a long track record of what's going on. So we're going to do our best to try to move our hands around and try to gesture around what the general likely changes will be. Uh, we're going to cut some of the uh, length of this session off because Ms. Bosjanic and Mr. Del Rosa have been very gracious with their time before they have to head back. And I'm sure there will be many relevant questions from what we're going to talk about on these slides based off of the Q&A that came up earlier. So like I said, we'll give everybody just another minute to filter in here. Oh, Stacy's all the way up front. There you go. <laughs> We can we can edit it in post. We'll get you in a suit in post. Yeah. <laughs> we might need to, uh, Jason. I don't know if we can get a mic just up here for Stacy on a permanent basis. Thanks. Okay. All right. So, like I said, we're going to try and predict some of the changes in eight hundred one seventy one rev three. The primary goal of this presentation though is not to give you my specific idea of what I specifically think the structure and substance of 800-171 Rev 3 will be, uh, as much as it is to give you a set of reference slides to enable you to submit better comments when the public draft of 800-171 Rev 3 comes out. I know that uh, our, our love and admiration for the rulemaking process has significantly biased against the uh, public comment process and how receptive or reactive the government is to that. I will say that NIST is much more reactive and responsive to public comments in their revisions. It is not actually part of the formal rulemaking process. So when we get a initial draft of 171 Rev 3, probably late spring is the latest estimation. That's probably sometime around May. I encourage everybody to submit public comments, and I hope that the slides here as a reference will make submitting those comments slightly easier. Uh, so the, yeah, so we'll get to that. So the, Stacey's question was, hasn't NIST already asked for public comments? And so we have a section in here where we'll talk about the initial, the pre-draft public comments, uh, and then there'll be a comment period on 171 Rev 3 for commenting on the new proposed standard. So, and we'll, we'll explain that as we go through. So in order to get everybody uh, to a point where we can submit better and more substantive and meaningful public comments on 171 Rev 3, as well as just sort of understanding the way that the winds are blowing, uh, we need to cover three things. We need to cover the 800 Rev 3 pre-draft public comments that were asked for in the fall of last year. We need to understand the structure and substance of the 853 Revision 4 moderate baseline and how it was tailored down to create 800-171 that we all know and love today. Then we need to understand how 853 has changed in the most recent revision, revision five. From there, we can extrapolate the general changes that are likely to appear in 171 Rev 3 that we'll all be asked to comment on in the springtime. So this is very important to understand because like Stacy said, if you've listened to anything that I've ever said, the key concept behind everything related to CMMC is that it is a DOD program that assesses a government-wide standard. 800 is a government-wide minimum baseline in order to protect the confidentiality of CUI. It is not a unique DOD set of requirements, right? They collaborated in the creation of the standard, but it is not their standard. It is NIST standard under the umbrella of the overall CUI program. So slightly off script here, because Stacy brought this up earlier about the FAR CUI rule. So the very quick story is that 800 is one part of a three-part plan to implement the overall government-wide CUI program. So the CUI program was started with the executive order from President Obama in 2010. That gave the speaking stick to NARA to create the CUI program and issue a rule. They delegated that authority to ISU, which is an office inside of the National Archives. They went through the rulemaking process. 
to make the CUI rule for all of the federal agencies, which is why all the agencies need their own CUI program. DOD is an agency, they have a CUI program. We're all downstream from that one. Maybe some of us are downstream from other agencies as well. That was the first part of this three-part plan. The other part of the three-part plan was a FAR CUI rule to take all of the standards about the CUI program and put it into a single acquisition regulation. So you have the rule that directs the agencies to create their programs. You have the rule that tells them how to apply the requirements of that program in their acquisition. And then you have 800 which is the normalized standard for the minimum protections of this information under the umbrella of this program. So a three-part plan to implement the overall CUI program. Federal CUI rule, FAR CUI rule, 800-171. So 800-171 is uh, very important to understand in sort of the, the, the overall context of where it fits. And there are many other stakeholders that are going to drive what the look and feel of 171 is besides just DOD, besides just DOD small businesses that are contractors and subcontractors. Very important voice, but it is not the only voice. And so we're going to try to explain where we fit in context here. Okay. So in the fall of last year, NIST asked for pre-draft public comments on 800-171 Rev 3. These are public comments. You can find them if you just Google 800-171 pre-draft comments. You can read them for yourselves. Uh, most of the identifying information is redacted and you can see exactly what people said for yourself. I encourage everybody to go read them and don't just take my word for it. Uh, I love reading comments. I love reading comments on rules. I love reading comments on NIST pubs. I love it almost as much as reading the rules and the NIST pubs themselves. So I went through and counted up, in my view, all of the comments and what they said in order to generate a heat map against 800 So if you read the NIST response to the public comments that they received pre-draft, they summarize it at a very high level. They don't necessarily go into a lot of detail. Uh, in, in my count, and this is a subjective count because you have 61 people and organizations that submitted a document with comments in it, but some of those documents are many, many pages long and they make several comments within those documents. So we didn't get 61 comments. You have like somewhere around 385 comments, at least in terms of how I read them. I would say Make sure you read them for yourselves. But if there was a mention about the controls in 800-171, counted them up and then created this heat map. Pop quiz, does anybody know what the number, the requirement number is for FIPS validation? I don't know if you can see a clue here <laughs> on this heat map, but it is a massive outlier in terms of people don't like it. They don't like it. Right. I, I, I don't want to belabor the point about FIPS validation as a requirement, but you cannot look through the pre-draft comments, which the pre-draft comments in 171 are from NIST turbo nerds and people who are very in tune with the ecosystem. These are people who knew that there was a pre-draft comment period. They knew what they were going to submit on. They took the time to do it. Right. This is not like a very widely known thing, even though 171 is this government-wide standard. And the number one comment that basically everybody had, whether they liked the standard, didn't like the standard, were confused about who owns the standard, didn't know the relationship between CMMC and what it doesn't matter. Small business, large prime, government offices, every single one of them said, we don't like FIPS validation. It's smelly, we don't like it, it's hard, it's expensive, it's difficult. It doesn't help us out. It causes, con you know, it causes conflict with patching, causes all these issues, right? So yes, everyone doesn't like FIPS. We don't know what NIST is going to do about FIPS. We know that the DODAM scoring system has some caveats for allowing encryption that is not FIPS. But yes, I, if anyone has questions about what's going to happen with FIPS, we don't know, right? We don't know. Clearly, going through the comments, NIST knows that it's a problem. Um, I don't know what they're going to do. Um, so yeah, so the heat map here is clearly FIPS. What you'll notice though, is that if we take the information from Mr. Del Rosso's top 10 other than satisfied findings, which are boxed in red versus the 
requirements that received the most public comments, they don't match, which I found to be a very interesting uh, data point in the comments. The ones that people missed most commonly are not necessarily the ones that people were discussing the most, whether they wanted it changed, they wanted it removed, whether they wanted it adjusted. So that I hope that uh, if you were looking through 800-171 and thinking about which controls you would like to comment on during that initial public draft comment period, refer to this slide because the ones that maybe jump to your mind as the ones that you want to comment on first are maybe not the ones that would cause the most issues when you actually undergo an assessment. Uh, does anybody notice that FIPS is both one of the most commonly missed uh, requirements and the ones that was most commonly commented on? So yeah, at least that one definitely lined up here. <clears throat> Okay, if you break this out by basic requirements and derived requirements, uh, it's just another way of splitting out the data if you find that interesting. Um, here's a point that we're gonna have to get in the weeds on a little bit before we move into 853. So the structure of 800-171 is split into what is known as basic requirements and derived requirements. You have basic and derived requirements within individual control families, the groups of the controls themselves. The easiest way to understand this is that basic requirements stem directly from a document called FIPS 200. This is a, this is a document. This isn't scary boogeyman FIPS encryption. It's the same acronym, different thing. So those relate directly to the requirements in FIPS 200. The way that I would describe FIPS 200 to you is that in the world of federal information security and subsequent standards that have riffed on or forked from 853 and NIST standards, FIPS 200 would be considered the bedrock of all of the security controls in 853 and then subsequently all of the control frameworks and standards that have emerged from there. So in 2004, when uh, Congress passed FISMA legislation, it basically required three things. It required a document we now call FIPS 200, which outlined 17 very high level goals. And if you notice, 853 originally had 17 families of controls that correspond directly to the goals in FIPS 200. The idea was is that federal agencies would categorize their systems and information based off of their risk assessments. They would need to meet all of these 17 goals in order to meet them, you would have to implement security controls from the 853 catalog. The process of pulling those controls out of the 853 catalog, tailoring them down, configuring them for your environment, applying them based off of your risk determination as a program or a federal agency, eventually became to know became uh, what we now know as the RMF or the Risk Management Framework Cycle. So 800-171 sometimes feels very far away from RMF. It is the output of the exact same process. It is the output at you know, the very end of that cycle of a minimum standard. So the tip here is that when you are submitting comments in the initial uh, comment period for NIST, don't expect that the requirements that are basic requirements can change all that much. If you look at 171 and you look at FIPS 200 directly and you look at the lines in a basic requirement and the line in FIPS 200, they are word for word exactly the same. So it is very, very unlikely, if not impossible, that a standard that is designed to protect federal information, categorized at moderate, that needs to meet the goals in FIPS 200, will remove any of the requirements that are basic requirements in 171. Derived requirements are slightly different. Derived requirements come directly from 853, and as we'll see in a moment, they are small slivers of the 853 controls in that catalog. So there's a lot more flexibility for changing, removing, adding, or otherwise tailoring the derived requirements than there is the basic requirements. Just something to keep in mind, if for some reason, like, you really hate 3.8.1, it's a lot less likely to go away or change significantly than something in the lower half of this diagram. Okay, so after NIST got the, uh, the pre-draft public comments, they um, supplied a summary. And it's mostly just a textual uh, recap of the kinds of comments that they received. It's a good document. I suggest that everybody reads through it. But the part that jumps out to me is not that they plan on updating it for consistency with Rev5. That's obvious to people who are familiar with how 853 works. 
everything that we have used for CMMC in 171 has been derivative of Rev4. It's been updated, therefore everything derivative from that standard also needs to be updated. That's fairly simple. It's not really a sort of revolutionary thing. Developing CUI overlays to link 171 to 53. As Mr. Del Rosso said, people don't read the appendices, right, to connect the dots between 171 and 853. So I would foresee that NIST is going to make this more and more apparent in the upcoming revisions. Uh, whether they call it an overlay, whether they call it an appendix, you know, we can debate the intricacies of what those words mean in the context of NIST parlance later. Just expect that you're going to see a lot more connections to 853 in the upcoming revision of 800 And then they said propose options to address NFO requirements, which we'll get into in a moment. The most interesting part and probably the most helpful part that I think for making the public comment process more useful, specifically for the NIST revision to 800 but especially to save Ms. Boschanek from having to read comments in the rulemaking process, is to understand what is in scope of what you're commenting on. So everyone hates FIPS validation, right? A lot of people want NFO controls removed. The 800-171 standard is not CMMC. The 800-171 standard is not the CUI program. The 800-171 standard does not address integrity and availability. The 800-171 standard is uh, not about software bill of materials. It's not about zero trust. It has nothing to do with the cost of compliance. It has nothing to do with assessing the requirements. It has nothing to do with how to negotiate with your contract officer. There are a, a, there's a smorgasbord of comments that got submitted to NIST about all of these other very legitimate, very real problems. And when NIST issues their response, they go, that's not relevant to what we're asking for in this standard. So use the heat map from the previous uh, chart and then specifically look at what they said is out of scope for 171. That way you can be a little bit more targeted in the comments that you submit on the upcoming revision. Now, if you're asking about assessment objectives, how to measure, how to evaluate, how to audit and assess, that will be in the revision to 800-171A. If you're asking about the requirements underlying CMMC level three, that would be in 172 and 172A, so on and so forth. The overall process of them revising what they call the CUI series, which is 171, 171A, 172, and 172A, is ongoing. But just realize that you'll need to submit your comments on the relevant standard and make sure that the comments that you're submitting are relevant at all. Uh, and that's, I think, where we'll leave it at that. I would encourage everybody to read the comments on your own, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. So... The connection between 800-171 and 853. Oh. So somebody just asked me, okay, but all those things are, are pertinent. So if I can't bring them up against the NIST 800-171, where do I bring them up, right? So you got to go to the root cause. If it's something about the assessment that would be applicable to CMMZ, put it in my rule comments. If it's something that goes to the CUI program, you got to go back to the owner of the CUI program to list your comments. And so Jacob's exactly right. You know, please be mindful of where you send your comments and make sure the comments that you're sending are applicable to the rule that you're responding to, because we have to weed through each and every one of those comments and try to form a response. And there's nothing less gratifying than to have to say, sorry, not my responsibility, right? And you guys don't want to hear that. So, you know, if you have questions, reach out. We can help you, direct you to the right place. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stacey. That was actually the subject of the talk that I gave at CS2 in DC last summer, where people are waiting for the CMMC program rule to come out to just lay into you and your team about the requirements in 171. That is not where those comments go. This is where those comments go. You got to talk to Ron Ross and Victoria Politeria at NIST about 171. And you talk to Stacy and her team about the CMMC program that assesses 800 If you have something specific with the CUI program, that is also a different rule that was done in 2016. I believe that's the INS office at the Pentagon. And uh, they are not here, unfortunately. Maybe at the next one, we'll be able to get somebody from INS. But if you want to gripe about CUI, marking, undermarking, overmarking, so on and so forth, INS are the people to talk to. Not even necessarily Stacy 
or NIST, I know. It's a lot of overlapping concentric circles of various government programs, but it will help because if you really lob it over the fence on the comment period for one or the other and it's not the right spot, there's really nothing that they can do. Okay, so the connection between 853 Rev 4 and 800-171 is probably one of the most important things that you can understand in order to realize exactly how 800-171 maps against the larger universe of security controls and just how small and narrow and myopic and lopsided and not representative of a holistic security program 800-171 actually is. It is a very, very narrowly tailored standard and that should... Um, Make everybody curious because everything that we talk about, cost, burden, impact, uh, outside of the cost of the assessment itself, stems from 800-171. And we're basically at rock bottom for how low we can go and how small we can make it. There's really nowhere to go except up from here by including new requirements in the standard. And that's going to cause some major issues. This revision is coming out as we're going through CMMC rulemaking as I'm sure everyone is aware, most people blame the CMMC program for the costs and impacts that stem from the 800-171 requirements, and they're being updated independently. So that's definitely going to make things very confusing. Okay, so you may have seen like on the heat map chart earlier, charts that uh, I believe folks in the DOD offices used to create, but we haven't ever really seen one that maps out what is in the 853 moderate baseline. So without getting too far in the weeds, the 853 catalog as a whole is very, very large. The Rev4 catalog has uh, somewhere around 900 controls and enhancements to those controls. Not all 900 are involved with implementing the controls. Sometimes you'll hear people say 853 compliance or I have to implement 853. You do not implement the entire catalog of controls. It's not how it works. It is a toolbox. It is a blank slate. It is a set of controls. It is a catalog from which you select controls, tailor them, fill in the variables, snap the baseline, and then you implement that baseline. Like I talked about with FISMA before, um, that legislation basically led to the creation of what is known as a low, moderate, and high baseline. These are subsets from the overall catalog. The one that is relevant to us is the 853 moderate baseline because controlled unclassified information is categorized at the moderate impact level. And so you start with the moderate subset of controls and then you tailor it from there in order to create what we now have in 800-171. Now, for those of you who are paying very close attention, you'll notice that the 853 moderate baseline has 261 controls and enhancements, but the moderate baseline from which 800-171 is derived has 263 controls. CM74 and CM75 are pretty wonky. There's a typo in 171 that has them both on the same line. They're not included in some of the updates in the editorial section at the beginning of the standards. We're just not gonna talk about them. The, the discrepancy between 261 and 263 is there on purpose. Please, please don't at me. Okay. Just to uh, go back to this real quick, I actually had some people get pretty upset on LinkedIn when I posted this as a teaser the other day. So 800-171, just to give you a sense of scale for how small 171 is compared to 853, it represents less than 20% of 853 revision four when you look at the difference between 171A and 853A. So 800-171A is the set of assessment procedures that you use to verify whether the requirements in 171 are actually implemented. If you're gonna verify that your controls from 853 are implemented, you use 853A, right? These are just tailored versions of those sort of two master catalogs. There are 320 assessment objectives in 800-171A. There are 1,589 assessment objectives in the 853 revision for moderate baseline. You do the math, that's 20%. As we'll see, the requirements in 800-171 are small snippets of those controls, and so therefore their assessment procedures are small snippets. So it is a very, very small sliver of the possible universe of what we had in Rev 4. And so as we'll see, 853 Rev 5 has gone up even more. So the universe of what NIST could possibly tailor in is very large. 
So the first step to get down to the 171 Rev 3 baseline is to tailor out controls that are specific to the federal government because 800-171 pertains to the protection of data in non-federal environments. And so controls that are specific to federal environments don't count. A lot of people will immediately sort of balk when you talk about 853 and they'll say that's for federal environments, right? If you notice, there are very few controls in 853 that are actually specific to a federal environment. Over time, as 853 has evolved, it has become increasingly what NIST would call flexible. That just means they've removed more and more specifics and details. I think that makes them less helpful as we move you know, through space and time here, but it makes them less specific to the federal environment. You can see this happening with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which a lot of people are big fans of. They're talking about removing references to the words critical infrastructure. Right? They're talking about removing references to you know, all of these program specific, you know, all this verbiage in order to make it more relevant and open-ended. So very little of 853 moderate was federal specific. So uh, the next step in tailoring was removing controls that are not related to protecting the confidentiality of information. So controlled and classified information is categorized at the moderate impact level, but the goal of the CUI program is to protect that data's confidentiality. The goal of the CUI program is not to protect its availability, not to protect its integrity, the parts of the CIA triad. It's just to protect confidentiality. And this is a major problem because the 853 catalog doesn't work that way. There are very, very few controls that are specific to only protecting integrity or only protecting confidentiality or only protecting availability. That's just not how security works. It's just not how security controls work. And so as a result, when you get handed constraints from the CUI program that say only moderate impact for confidentiality, and then you look at this menu of controls that are not built that way, NIST ends up having to go through and just pick and choose parts of controls that are kind of the confidentiality part or just cut off controls that aren't related to confidentiality at all. So as you'll notice, the CP family, the contingency planning family, this covers things like your disaster recovery and your business continuity. Uh, you know, how are you going to recover from outages and things like that? And basically been dictated to not have anything to do with confidentiality at all. However, if a DOD supplier were to experience an incident and be unable to recover, that would be a serious problem. And so it's clearly relevant to what the DOD is concerned about, what anybody would be concerned about in their supply chain, but within the constraints of the tailoring of the standard, it's not included. And this is going to, surely you can sort of pick up on where we're going here, lead to a fundamental philosophical question. What do we want 171 to do? Do you want it to represent a holistic approach to the CIA triad for a company that is processing data and just exists in the world? Because if you do, you've got a huge universe of controls here that are suddenly relevant. If you want to narrowly constrain it down to just be a minimum standard that only focuses on data confidentiality, we can get rid of all this stuff. But that's going to sort of create this humongous gap. I mean, all we've heard about all day, all we've heard about for the last few years, what do we do about this? What do we do about that? If you read the comments, what about integrity? What about availability? What about this? What about that? That's not what the tailoring of the standard was designed to do. So when you submit your comments, I'm not even sure if it's possible because NIST is operating under the direction of the CUI program. I'm not sure how much of the extra controls they can sort of justify including, uh, but what do we want it to do, right? And it's, this may be a situation, just sort of going off script here momentarily, if 800171 has these gaps in it on purpose, and it is worthwhile for us to plug those gaps, it's up to DOD to specify what the additional requirements are in order to plug those gaps specifically, right? Through something separate. Does everybody remember the Delta 20 from CMMC 1.0? Do you know what those were? Yeah, the Delta 20 were all these gaps that we tailored out of the standard. So as we see here, another one of the tailoring procedures, if you want to follow along, just open up 800-171, scroll to the back and go to Appendix E. It has all this information mapped directly to 853 and what they tailored out and what those codes mean. This one, NFO controls, is easily the most mind-boggling set of requirements and probably the place where we'll see the biggest changes 
in Rev3 coming up because it's easy enough to say certain controls in gray are only unique to the federal environment. Certain controls in sort of sky blue are only relevant to confidentiality, kind of. But in order to make the standard even smaller, the logic basically went, okay, companies exist, they have data, they are self-interested organizations that care about protecting that data. We are giving them data in these systems that already exist. So they must have thought about this to some extent, right? Like it, it clearly is not that they just didn't do anything and they don't have an information security program and they don't have documentation and they don't self-assess their, uh, their security controls and they don't think about their managed service provider and they don't do backups and they don't do this and they don't do that. There's no way that that's what non-federal organizations do on average. And so we went through and just chopped out a bunch of stuff. If you notice this blue row all the way across the top, those are all the policy and procedure controls, right? Those are assumed to exist. If you've gone through an assessment, if you've listened to anything that Mr. Del Rosso has said, you will know you cannot pass an assessment if you don't have policies and procedures. If you scroll through 800-171, there's no requirement to have policies and procedures. So we clearly have an issue. I would assume that the Dark blue squares here, if you look in 53 Rev 4, 53 Rev 5, are the most likely ones that can be tailored back in because they were not tailored out because they were federal specific. They were not tailored out because they were confidentiality. They were tailored out based on assumption. There's 61 of them. That's a lot of stuff that could be tailored back in. You should know that the pre-draft public comments from NIST that were submitted, the second most common comment besides we hate FIPS and you need to get rid of it immediately, was tailor the NFOs back in the standard. I mean, like a close second from all of those 300 comments that weren't specific to controls, which I think was somewhere around 200, 250 comments, the number one most common thing was take those dark blue squares, put them back into 800-171. What are we gonna do? We just talked about how even the, a, the coming AI singularity chat GPT generative AI model isn't even helpful if you try to get help with implementing the controls. And now you're talking about increasing the size of the standard by 50% if you were to include these new ones in there. Is that what we want 171 to do? Shout out in support if, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a, it is a rhetorical question because we either leave the standard the same where it is completely unhelpful, it assumes a massive amount of pre-existing maturity, and it takes a lot of time and effort to try to cross-reference and reverse engineer what it is that they're talking about from 853, or we put that information back in the standard, and then suddenly you've got a standard that's 250 pages long, and it's basically like reading 853. I don't, I don't know what the solution is there, right? There's, like a, there's a famous saying that says there's no solutions, there's only trade-offs, and that's a significant trade-off. I'm, I'm not sure what the right answer is. Personally, my, my own view is that it is more helpful to have the details in there rather than not have them in there. That way you don't have to go to a conference and then get surprised and find out that there's actually all this stuff in dark blue that you should have been doing already. No, nobody hates anything more than the government or assessors or smarmy LinkedIn people saying you should have been doing it already, right? And the should have been doing it already is amplified by these dark blue NFO controls. So I would definitely familiarize yourself with those if you're thinking about submitting comments. The remaining controls here in delightful CUI purple uh, are the controls that are the CUI baseline. For those of you keeping score at home, you'll notice that there are 126 controls from the 853 Rev4 moderate baseline that correspond to the protection of confidentiality of CUI. How many requirements are in 800-171? It's 110. So how did we get from 126 down to 110? We had to do more tailoring. And so some of the tailoring here gets very creative, and this is why it's important to understand FIPS 200, because they took those 126 controls and they just kind of went and like moved them around and said, well, you know, there's controls that are specific within this family, but the family is trying to implement the goal in FIPS 200. Everybody knows what they're doing with security controls. So just take the controls out entirely and put in the language from FIPS 200. 
Uh, for those of you who are big NIST nerds, there's a clear loop here that's causing a problem. You are supposed to take controls out of 853 and implement them to meet the goals in FIPS 200. In 800-171, we have requirements that all look the same. Some of them are the goals, some of them are the controls. Like, I don't know if anybody, the, like, I know that some people from NIST may be listening to this. Please stop doing that. Please don't do that. This is supposed to be a derivative of a control catalog that has corresponding assessment procedures. If you want to have a reference to FIPS 200, that should be very clear in the standard because it is extremely, it's confusing for me. And I, I absolutely love reading these things. Please, please don't do that. It is extremely confusing. The difference between a basic and a derived control is really not all that helpful for actual implementation and assessment. It's mostly a curiosity that lets me do these talks. So I, I will be submitting a comment that says, stop formatting it that way. <clears throat> okay, so when I said that the controls in 800-171 are snippets of 853, I was super duper serious, right? I would encourage you to just pick at random a requirement in 800-171 and then look at the corresponding control in 853, and you will notice that there are like a handful of words that come from the 853 control that then form the requirement. There is a standing DOD policy that is directed to contracting officers and program managers that says when you have questions about 800-171, and we all know there are many, many questions, you should go reference the language in 853 from which it was derived, right? It is way easier to just go back and start with the information in 853 rather than assuming that these are somehow different Rather than creating a different standard and then letting people think that CMMC is somehow its own thing, CMMC is evaluating the NIST 171 requirement, which is a shadow of the actual control. Now, here's what I'll say. I can feel, I can feel your energy, right? There is a lot more information in 853 than there is in 800-171. That's the trade-off, right? That's the trade-off. If you want to know the additional context around what that control means, the only place that you can really go is the 853 catalog. And so when people comment to NIST, when people comment to Stacy, when people comment to Nick and to DOD, and they say, we don't know what to do, where do you think they're going to pull the information from? They're going to pull it from 853. Just go back to the 53 control directly, and we can stop doing this like cross-reference, jump back and forth thing, right? That's my personal recommendation. You can see the same uh, difference here when you evaluate 53A and 171A. The determination statement in the assessment objective that you need to meet this big boogeyman, how do I pass an assessment, how do I know if this control is implemented, is a tiny fraction of the assessment procedure for the corresponding control. So I know this sounds crazy, but if you don't know what to do and how to implement a control, just Take a deep breath and read the corresponding assessment procedure in 53A. And as you sort of get used to the weird NIST language and the weird formatting, it's not the best. But as you get used to it, you will notice it is basically a set of steps. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you configured in accordance with what you did in the previous step? Have you done what you were saying that you were doing in the first step? And they follow all along. They all follow the same pattern. 171A does not do that. And this is really the great irony of CMMC. CMMC is taking those assessment objectives in 171A and then calling them the CMMC program because it's relevant to DOD specifically. It is built on a standard in 171 that assumes a massive amount of pre-existing maturity. CMMC claims to be a maturity model. Do you see the problem, right? We are evaluating people on maturity by assuming that all of the things that represent maturity are already done. But that leads to this very difficult decision of, are we going to unwind that assumption and assume that people don't have that pre-existing security maturity, which I would, I think it's a safe bet to say based off all the evidence that we have so far, those NFO assumptions are not valid, right? That pre-existing maturity does not exist. We're all sort of working in a reverse bubble of security controls here where everything that we tailored out probably needs to get tailored back in. Okay. Now the really good news, everything in 853 has gotten bigger. So if you start out with this chart here of how we tailored the Rev4 baseline, we're going to step through and we're gonna add in what was added in 853 Rev5. 
and then we can sort of see which way things might work for Rev3. So the first one, you guys are gonna love this. So controls that were withdrawn. When you hear withdrawn, what do you think? You would think that these are all the controls that went away, right? So we can start with the 53 Rev4 baseline and we can take away 21 controls. That's not how it works in the world of NIST. There are very, very few controls ever since the original version of 853 that ever have ever objectively gone away, right? Um, most controls get moved entirely or incorporated into other controls. Some of the assessment objectives that you have for configuration management used to be their own controls in old, old versions of 853. So if you go through and you look at Rev5 and it says this was incorporated into this other control, the only way to find it is to go to 53A and you'll find that entire control language as a determination statement. So withdrawn controls don't actually go away. The exception here in Rev5 is VoIP, voice over IP. That one has been withdrawn and is supposed to be treated as any other protocol. So objectively, that one is probably gonna go away. NIST has up updated their password complexity policies. So that one would probably also likely go away as well as split tunneling, which I know there are some people here who are big fans of the fact that this has gone away. Those ones objectively would probably not be included in 800.171 Rev3. Any of these other ones, are fair game because they've just been shifted around. So that leads to an interesting question. If you take something that was a CUI control and then you move it into a different CUI control, it was withdrawn, will it go away? I don't know, right? So is, will NIST sort of get creative here? And I love the people at NIST. I'm not gonna say that they're gonna do this on purpose, but there is clearly a method that they could adopt where they could say, we've withdrawn a bunch of controls from 171, but the assessment procedures in 171A are still the same or they've gotten larger. Does that make sense? So be very careful whenever you look at controls that have been withdrawn when you're thinking about how that's gonna impact the format of 171. Some of the more interesting ones, um, configuration management 2.1, gets incorporated into configuration management too. So the control enhancement gets incorporated into the base control. If you look here, CM21 uh, is not a CUI control, but it gets incorporated into the CUI base control. So if you take an NFO assumption or an NCO control, it's not related to confidentiality, and you put it into a CUI control, does that suddenly make it relevant? We don't know. Something to think about whenever you think about how the changes in 53 have changed. Okay, the other uh, set of changes are controls that existed in 853 Rev4 that, have, that were not in the moderate baseline that have been included in the moderate baseline under Rev5. There are, let me double check here, 18 of these. 18 of these. So as you use this chart for a reference, you may notice here under access control, AC2, all of the control enhancements, the ones in parentheses, are not related to confidentiality. We've added new control enhancements, so it's probably pretty likely that those would not be included because they're not related to confidentiality, but we're not sure. So a useful comment to NIST would be, AC25 and AC213 were elevated in the 853 moderate baseline. They should not be included in 800 because the other enhancements to AC2 are not related to confidentiality, right? That is a sort of constructive comment that shows NIST, hey, this isn't relevant, don't include it in the baseline. If you go, it's expensive, Right? That's, it's not that that's not true, it's just that's not the language that NIST speaks. And this is, I think, my, NIST is gonna love this. We talk in security a lot about speaking the language of the business, right? When it comes to revisions to NIST standards, you are in the business of NIST. And so it is very helpful if you speak their language when you give them your comments, because the tables have turned here, we're sort of going the opposite direction. So use these as a reference in order to say this control is not categorized as this in Rev4, therefore that should keep the same categorization, it should change the categorization, this is how you should adjust the tailoring. Okay, the biggest and scariest ones are the controls that are entirely new under 853 uh, Rev5. Obviously the biggest one here is there is an entirely new control family 
which is the supply chain risk management family of security controls. Pop quiz, is supply chain risk management relevant to the confidentiality of CUI? Yes? No? How do we know? What parts of those controls are relevant? What parts of those controls are not? Supply chain risk management is clearly important. Should we tailor those into the baseline? If we did nothing uh, to the 800-171 baseline, but we just looked at the SR family in Rev5, there is probably a 0% chance that some of the language from a brand new control family would not be included in 800-171 Rev3. So take a very close look in Rev5, or sorry, 853. Uh, take a close look in 53 Rev5 at these ones in red specifically, because those are the new ones, brand new controls that have not existed before. And so I would say that those are probably very likely candidates for having some sliver of their language included in 800 If you don't want that to happen, look at those controls and think about, is this an NFO assumption? Is this not related to confidentiality? Is this federal specific? That's the comment that you should probably submit in order to have the most effect on what the resulting baseline actually ends up looking like. Okay, so like I said, all these slides are for reference, so check out the controls in 853 and the heat map controls in 800-171 and use that in order to figure out what you know how you can shape your comment. I believe Nis, uh, Stacy and Nick are still here. There were some questions earlier. I have a question. Is Stacy here? She left. Oh. She said she did a great job. Wonderful. Well, of course, she dipped out right before this question. I don't know if anybody picked up on my confusion earlier. I am extremely confused about what is happening with the rule. The reason that this is relevant to DOD contractors is DFAR 7012 says you have to implement the most current version of NIST SP 800 in existence at the time of your solicitation. That's what it says. It's incorporated by reference and we're on revision two, which is exactly why they didn't have to go through rulemaking changes for DFAR 7012 any of the previous times that it has been changed. This is the first time that the source material in 853 has changed significantly, which means that the source material in 171 is going to change significantly. So 7012 will not have to change. You'll just have to implement that new set of requirements in 171 Rev 3. So why would the CMMC rule not work exactly the same way? She said something about this. We're gonna have to figure, go stop the plane, right? Go, go <laughs> someone find her. We will follow up and let everybody know. I have no idea what that meant, but I have a sinking feeling that we're going to have a disparity here where the contract officers and your customers are going to demand that you implement 171 Rev 3, which you're contractually obligated to do. Probably Nick Del Rosso and his team are going to show up and evaluate you against that standard because that's what's in 7012. But your CMMC C3 PAO is going to ask you questions about 800-171 Rev 2. That is not a good idea. Uh, so we will definitely follow up on that question. Uh, but yeah, that is, I, I, I want to know more about what's happening there. So who has questions, uh, not for Stacy since she had to dip out. I don't know if there's some online. Here we go on the left side. I have a question for Nick. Um, is Nick present? Yep. So, so the question is, uh, when we talked about the uh, JSP program and the number of assessments that were passed, and the answer was there's no pass-fail, how many JSP assessments have been conducted? Uh, I think I mentioned earlier, um, right now, I would venture to say 10 to 15. Um, that number should be going up in the future as we have a lot more scheduled now. Great. And then the second follow-on question is, how many DIBCAC highs did we do last year? Last year, I want to say 120. Okay. And then finally, uh, for, for some clients who have received DIBCAC highs before, the, the concept originally, I think, was because they were high-risk program, the contracting officers had asked DIBCAC to go, hey, we, we want to have a level of assurance that cybersecurity is being followed here, so you were asked to go do a high. Is it DIBCAC's intent to redo those on the three-year cycle, or are you guys going to go look at 
uh, other clients and then tell them that they need to, you know, submit their basic self-assessment and stuff. Yep. So that depends on the specific contractor. Um, I think right now our immediate focus is making sure we cover enough of the dib, right, to kind of ensure that we're buying down that risk for DOD. Um, so we may not hit those contractors, you know, at that three-year mark. Um, we may wait until four years. Um, some may do joint surveillance, which we would part then participate in. So it varies based on the risk posed to DOD. Vince, uh, you don't want to fight about 853? Are we doing that at lunch? You and I have gone back and forth over the years about this fight. So it, you, you have, did you have anything on 53? Oh, he lost his mic? That's okay. We'll talk at lunch. I was definitely expecting with your first question that we were going to fight in person. So <laughs> what's up? Amira. Uh, sorry, Jacob. I'm going to ask Nick no, no, while I have fine. a chance. Uh, so I'm a assessor for CMMC, and I would say that probably 50% of this audience, if not more, is looking at using a virtual desktop infrastructure solution uh, to achieve CMMC compliance. And this question is, comes up over and over and over and over again um, because the, the virtual desktop infrastructure, the idea is that you have a not very secure computer accessing a secure enclave. But when we look at precedent from DIBCAC, how they've been assessing C3 PAOs, how they've been assessing uh, DIB companies, it seems like that endpoint, which is not part of the enclave, it's got a weird status somewhere between um, not in scope and we expect it to be fully secured. And it almost seems to be in a special category, which is above that CMMC term of contract or risk managed asset. It seems to be a higher expectation. Can you explain uh, what what the standard is for those devices? Uh, sure. So when you have something like a VDI, right, um, you're using it because you want to keep other stuff out of scope of an assessment. And so the key there is to implement some technical controls and make sure that nothing can be transferred to your local machine from that VDI. Um, and I think if you do that, right, and you do it properly, uh, that relieves a lot of the uh, assessment from those particular endpoints. Uh, at that point, uh, we just have some minor concerns where, and I think I've spoken previously, you know, we want to ensure some of the basics, almost like that CRMA, right, where you're running some AV. Um, you know, there's some... Uh, folks that would try to argue all endpoints are in scope um, and it kind of defeats the purpose of what people are trying to accomplish with the use of that VDI. Like it, technically you could intercept keystrokes or images or whatever from the endpoint, but it's really cutting hairs, right? And so if you treat it more along the lines of that CRMA uh, with some basic you know, security, whether it's the AV or just some control on those devices, um, I don't see where that would subject it to the full scope of all the controls uh, and essentially, you know, make sure that you control that VDI environment correctly, um, but it should relieve the need to pull in all those endpoints and do an assessment. If I could piggyback on that real quick. So just to clarify, that means no drive mapping, on the endpoint, it means no printing off of the endpoint, et cetera. So no information transfer other than screen scrapes essentially can come across. Okay. All right, Jacob, got a question over here to your left. There we go. There we go. There you are. All right, down front. Allison, you ready? Okay, a question for you, Jacob. I'm sorry, Nick. Um, we've talked about this before. In what scenario, what timeline does Rev3 for NIST whether it's a CMMC interim or CMC, CMC, CMMC proposed rule, is there a better case scenario with less chaos? Yeah, so I think that it's, um, so, so for those unfamiliar, we're waiting on rulemaking. There's really one of two situations. The rule could possibly come out as an interim final rule and be effective this year. 
most likely based off what we've heard comes out as a proposed rule, in which case it would be effective next year. Uh, NIST is getting ready to release their initial draft. We would expect that the final version of 800-171 Rev 3 would be out as soon as the end of this year. NIST is much better and much quicker about meeting their timelines or even moving those timelines up. They've done this in the past where they've uh, up, they've actually accelerated the release of NIST documents in the event of like government shutdowns and things like that to get them published. So this is not DOD rulemaking. If you are a company that is already ahead of the game and you have implemented 171 Rev 2, it is probably in your best interest to have an interim final rule come out sooner. That way you can get assessed against the current smaller standard. You don't have to deal with whatever these crazy changes are going to be because the 171 Rev 3 will almost inevitably be larger in some way, right? Uh, if the rule is proposed, which apparently is sort of what the common consensus is leaning towards, that means that 171 Rev 3 will be out. It will be incorporated by reference in your DFAR 7012 clauses. Contract officers, program managers, your prime purchasers will be expecting uh, in their updated questionnaires for you to represent 171 Rev 3. And the CMMC program will not be effective until many months later, perhaps a year later. And so as a result, you're going to have to update whatever the delta is if you are a company that has not gotten started yet, then the amount of things that you will have to do will only increase. So it's probably better for companies that have already done, it's always better to have implemented the requirements because there's less to do whenever it changes. And there's the possibility that you can avoid having to get assessed against those changes if the rule zigs instead of zags. Got one in the middle, Jacob. Jacob, are you, <clears throat> are you concerned at all that the population in the DIB, which is small business that dominates the percentage, 80, 90 percent, has the fewest uh, number of comments? Therefore, they're not really driving um, in a significant way the outcome. So on your previous slide, small business was 11 percent of the comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's concerning, right? Yeah, it's a big problem. I think that the feedback from the standard is in clear tension with what the purpose of the standard is. One of the key things to remember about 171 is it is a lot of the criticisms against 171 is it's not risk-based. It's not risk-based. It's not risk-based. 171 is reflective of the government data owner's risk tolerance. When that data ends up in your environment and you are stewarding, stewarding their data, it's, it's more like a privacy standard than it is a security standard. And so if all of the feedback comes from practitioners and people who are more well-versed in the standards and they go, this is clearly related to 53. I hate having to go back when I'm using the standard and cross-reference and do the double checks. Please just put the information in the catalog. I mean, you know, full disclosure, that's how I feel about it because I'm like, I hate having to go back and redo these changes. So my comments are just give me the same raw material and then we can be on our way. Uh, for a company that's already underwater and already underwhelmed or overwhelmed, that's a bad situation because the water only gets deeper. So I don't know what they're going to do. NIST is NIST and DOD and NARA, who collaborated on 171, are in a serious pickle. Right? I mean, this is a fascinating problem to watch because what do they do? They have cut out all of the details that that reflect the reality of what it takes to implement these requirements. And so now our expectation is set artificially low. People are already struggling with that artificially low bar. And if you say we need to update for threats, we need to update for our risk, we need to update for this or that or this, any of these other you know, perfectly justifiable reasons for including new controls, well, all of a sudden you're just gonna make that problem even worse, right? And so you can't reduce the standard there, there's very few ways that you could reduce the standard, not FIPS, not FIPS. There's very few ways that you could reduce the standard any further. And there's probably not enough ways for you to reduce this standard to make it super simple, super easy, point and click. Every small business ever gets to spend no money, no time, no effort, doesn't have to worry about it. It won't disrupt their environment, their business process, how they operate. There would be no controls on the list. And that's not really who NIST stakeholders are. NIST is designed to create standards that are minimums for reflecting government risk acceptance. When you toss that over the wall into the supply chains, as we have validated, everything breaks. So is that NIST responsibility to fix in 171 or is that DOD's responsibility to fix with money, 
right? With money. And so when CMMC 2.0 aligns directly to 171, DOD, I don't know if this was a 4D chess move or not, but DOD gets to go, whoa, 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 we're not specifying any new controls. We're just doing what NIST sets as the minimum standard. So you're going to talk to them. But then you submit your comments to NIST. It says cost, burden, impact, right? Complexity, small business. And they go, that's not relevant. You got It's the pointing Spider-Man meme, right? And so what happens? Because the rule is clearly happening, right? It's taking a long time, but the rule is clearly happening. Revisions are clearly happening. Everything's still rolling along. I think based off the numbers that Mr. Del Rosso has on his charts, stuff's trending upward maybe kind of right but it isn't reflective of what's really going on i think especially as the meps know what's really happening on the ground so yeah it's concerning it's uh it is a precarious time and all all roads lead to 7012 and 7012 incorporates this by reference so please use this chart to form formulate some of your comments yes sir so you talked about how a 800, 171, and 172 only address the confidentiality of CUI. Do you anticipate uh, the DOD and the government looking more critically at this and understanding that they need to also be protecting the integrity and availability of CUI? Maybe, maybe. But so this is so the National Cybersecurity Strategy, strategy came out, right? Everybody's familiar with the Natty Strategy. Right, as you'll notice in the news, every time a different sector has to get new security requirements, we go through this weird rigmarole of, well, who can we regulate and how? And we have the government basically has to use their existing authorities to regulate certain sectors, and they have to operate within the constraints of those authorities to impose requirements or not. If there's no authorities, you're out of luck, government. And so that's really the debate with this national security strategy. The reason why everybody knows that 800-171 is not a holistic standard, but we're assessing that standard is because that's what's in line with the existing authorities. If DOD wants to expand beyond that baseline to all the other stuff that we're missing, we're going to have to get new authorities. We're going to have to change authorities. That's going to mean I have to talk to Congress. There's going to have to be other action and there's going to have to be all this other stuff. It could happen, but there's probably not a big appetite for that. So it gets back to that sort of philosophical debate of maybe 171 shouldn't be the standard that we're using because it is too small, but based off of existing authorities that might be this like weird tailoring of all these colored boxes might just be the, 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 the hack of that existing authority. So should they, ought they? Yes. But will they? They have to operate within the constraints of CUI program, DOD authorities, so on and so forth. So and just to piggyback on that, um, Vic, Vicky Pilateri came out at the last CS2 and basically said straight up, they will not add anything that's outside of confidentiality into 800171. So that's why we don't see backups, et cetera. A um, couple online questions, Jacob. Sure. So since many organizations are at different degrees of maturity and documenting procedures, often smaller organizations performing objectives ad hoc and could be appropriate for the size of their organization, do you think requiring a maturity model like CSF, which allows for ad hoc implementations with an 800 overlay, wouldn't a maturity model make more sense than requiring the NFOs? No. No, I know, Please we're, up expand. I know we're up against lunch, right? If you go to 171 Rev 2, NIST has mapped 171's overlap to the CSF. If you notice in any of the debates around how the CSF is going to change, CSF does not include a governance function. They're talking about adding it. The CSF is just, okay, uh, I know we're up against us. The CSF is just an abstraction of 853 in the same way that 800-171 is clearly an abstraction. You're just saying the same thing in a different way. A lot of people love the CSF because the language that is used is a lot more approachable. They color coded it. There's actually a diagram that they use. If you look through 853, there's no colors, there's no diagrams. It's just a thousand pages of text, right? So it's, they would clearly prefer it. Whether you decide to use the CSF as the front end to your governance program is perfectly up to you. There's nothing that says that you can't use it. But if you look at the CSF for all of the parts at the identify function of the uh, of the model, if you look at the corresponding 853 controls, they're all the NFO controls, right? They're all the dark blue ones. So if you like the CSF, use it. It's all the same. It's all 853 under the hood. 
Awesome. We have, let's do we have time for one more? Yeah, I think we got one, one more. more follow up. And this is this is going to be for Nick. So if anybody wants to fight at lunch about CSF as an abstraction, I I love that fight. Yes, yeah, so. we we triggered you just in Man, time for lunch. Yeah. So this, triggered. This is a second part uh, back to Amira's question about um, about VDI and uh, the endpoint devices. If the end user device is a is a BYOD device, so not a corporate owned organization or a corporately owned asset, there are no controls from the company you know on that machine at all. So it can save your ID, password, et cetera. How do we deal with that? I would say that makes implementing VDI challenging when you have the BYOD, right? Um, you have none of those technical restrictions to prevent the transfer locally. Um, there could be things implemented on that BYOD, right? Um, now, there may be some solutions with certain VDI environments where you can prohibit that transfer. And you know, I think that's where the key is, um, but it is much, much more challenging when you have no control over that endpoint. 